Gracious God, we ask that we would have such a clear vision of you, your greatness, your glory, your grace, and your love, your plan and your purpose, your saving work in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to forgive our sins, to redeem us, to make us your own, to guarantee for us an eternity in your presence with fullness of joy. We pray that we would have such a great vision of these things that we could not help but be ready ambassadors, heralds, messengers, proclaimers of these things. That your message, your great gospel, your love would flow from our lips. That it would be our meditation, the topic of our conversation, our boast, our song. That all whom we run into would hear from us these great things about you and what you've done. We ask this morning that you would direct our hearts to the things that you love, to the things that you're about, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we would understand you and your ways. We thank you that you have penned these words for us in Scripture that we might know. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. I am eager to interrupt your regularly scheduled programming this morning. Uh, You know that Scott Maxwell has been preaching through the book of Romans, verse by verse, by verse, by verse, and will continue to do so, but we are interspersing that series with what we've called a philosophy of ministry series. It's an opportunity for you to hear sort of the the behind-the-scenes convictions that drive how we do church at Grace Bible Church, why we do what we do, what motivates us, what drives us, what biblical principles govern the programming that you see week to week. And so you've heard preach the word, shepherd the flock, equip the saints, grow the church. This morning, the message is make disciples, make disciples. And this one in particular deals with not just the church and how we do church and why we do church the way we do church, but also why you are here, why you exist on this earth. This great commission to make disciples addresses why you are alive. You see, we think about what the church does, what the church must do, the kinds of activities the church is involved with, and many of those things that we do here now are pre-reflections of what we will be doing there, knowing God, worshiping God, serving God, loving one another, being conformed to the image of Christ, but a lot of those things are things that will be perfected in eternity. In fact, we'll do all of those things better in heaven than we do them here. Yet there is a great task, a great assignment, which the Lord Jesus gave his church, which we cannot do in heaven, which we can only do here, and is in fact the reason we are still here. If God's purpose for your life was to forgive your sins, conform you to the image of Christ, cause you to know all truth, and worship Him perfectly, you would get saved and then get hit by a bus. You'd be in heaven. That is His ultimate purpose for you, and there's no doubt we should aim at these things here. But there is a task for which you have been redeemed, equipped, to do here which you cannot do in heaven. And that is what we're covering this morning. It is to make disciples. This message answers the question, not what does the church do necessarily, but even why the church is here. And for every individual believer, similarly, why am I here? This morning's message comes from Matthew 28, In the last words of the gospel of Matthew, 
Matthew records Jesus' commissioning of the disciples. This text has rightly been called the Great Commission, although each one of the gospel records records Jesus' instructions to his disciples along this theme. The book of Acts also records this, and it is unfolded through the book of Acts and reiterated throughout the New Testament. But here in Matthew chapter 28, we have what Bible readers have for a long time called the Great Commission. It's not the great suggestion, the great option, the great alternative. It is the Great Commission. And like the other philosophy of ministry convictions we've talked about so far, this is in the DNA of the church. It is the warp and woof of what makes Grace Bible Church what it is. It is our reason to be. And it is true not just for the institution of the church and for any local church, but it is also true of every individual believer. This is the DNA of every Christian. And a commission is an assignment, a task, a set of instructions. It is marching orders. And the commission is this, making disciples of Jesus Christ among all of the nations on the earth. This is what we must be about as a church, and this is what every follower of Jesus must be about as an individual. Let's read it together, Matthew 28, beginning in verse 18. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is the great commission, a a command from Jesus to his disciples. And the command in verse 19 is sandwiched in between Jesus' universal authority that guarantees success and Jesus' personal presence that provides comfort. We could say that another way. Jesus has given us a command, and it's helpful for us to know that He is Lord and He is with us. I want you to remember where Matthew 28, 18 to 20 sits in your Bible. Just as a little bit of review, it follows the rest of Matthew chapter 28, which follows Matthew chapter 27 and and on and on. We cannot separate the Great Commission from the events unfolded, especially at the end of the book of Matthew, the cross work of Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We cannot separate this task to the church from the death, burial, and resurrection of our Savior. By his death, he purchased people with his own blood. And by his resurrection, he demonstrates that his payment for sin was accepted before the Father. And by his resurrection, death itself is defeated. The resurrection changes everything. It grants to anything Jesus says after that an authority that only belongs to one who is stronger than death and whose plan is to redeem people from the curse of death. And so we read the Great Commission in the context of Matthew 27 and 28. In Matthew 27, of course, is the the trial of Jesus, that sham mock trial, a travesty of justice leading to his mockery and beating and torture and death. And I want to pick up the narrative in Matthew 28, 1. Now, after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. And the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, just as he said. Come, see the place where he was lying. Go quickly, tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee." There you will see him. 
Behold, I have told you. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee. And there they will see me. While, while they were on their way, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers and said, this is what you are to say. His disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this should come to the governor's ears, we will win him over and keep you out of trouble. And they took the money and did as they had been instructed. And this story was widely spread among the Jews and is to this day. But the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee, some 60 miles. And if you walked 20 miles a day, that's three days. To the mountain which Jesus had designated. And when they saw him, they worshiped, but some were doubtful. What were the disciples who had probably already seen the resurrected Christ at this time doubtful about? Probably doubtful as he approached, is it him? Is this where we're supposed to be? And verse 18 tells us, Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, and he gave the commission. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus commands his disciples to make disciples from all the nations of the earth. And this morning, we're going to observe three features of Jesus' commission to the church. The first feature of this commission is the universal authority that guarantees its success. There is a universal, comprehensive authority that belongs to Jesus that guarantees the success of this enterprise. We see that in verse 18. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All authority. All authority on heaven and on earth, it's a way of saying everything from A to Z, it all belongs to him. And this passive verb, it has been given, the idea here is that God, his father, gave to him this authority. This is a confirmation that Jesus, the Christ, is Lord. He's Lord over the things in heaven supernatural beings. He is Lord over everything on the earth. He is Lord of lords. He is in charge of everyone that's in charge of something. He is Lord over the chief priests and over the betrayer with whom they conspired. He is Lord over Pilate, over Herod, over Caesar. He is Lord over Jewish councils and the leaders who incited the mob against him. He's Lord over the mob of people who called for his murder. He's Lord over the Roman soldiers who stripped him and beat him and mocked him and spit upon him. He is Lord over the soldiers who drove the nails into his hands and feet. He is Lord over Satan who incited Judas to betray Jesus. He is Lord over the temple and its curtain, over the sun that went dark, over the earth that quaked. He is Lord over everything. He is Lord over death itself. Consider the authority of Jesus on display in the simple fact of his arranging this meeting with his disciples. Matthew 26, 31 and 32. You can turn back there. Jesus gives instructions to his disciples. By the way, there's 11 of them, not 12, because Judas has defected. Jesus says to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Look at Matthew 28, 16. Jesus tells the women leaving the tomb about this meeting. 
I'm sorry, uh, 28, 7. He tells the women, go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. This is the angel speaking. And behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And in verse 10, Jesus meets the women and says, don't be afraid. Tell my brethren to leave for Galilee and there they will see me. And then in 28, 16, the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated. This is a remarkable scene. Who does this? Who, who plans for a meeting to take place after he would give himself over to being arrested, tried, beaten, mocked, abandoned, tortured, and killed? Guys, here's the plan. Meet me a week from Tuesday at the spot that we talked about. After you've scattered in fear, I need to regroup you and give you some instructions. Before that, I'm going to die. You see, Jesus is in charge of all of these things. He is the one who laid down his own life and took it up again. He, he is the one who gave up his own spirit. Nobody has power over life and death but God himself. And Jesus, the God-man, lays down his own life, takes it up again, and plans to meet the disciples afterwards to give them these instructions. Jesus' authority on display here, all authority in heaven and on earth, means that the assignment he gives to his disciples is backed by the purpose and power of the one who holds all things in his hands. Every knee will bow to him. Every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Jesus has purposed to accomplish something, to win for himself a redeemed people from every tongue and tribe and nation. And nothing can thwart that purpose. Nothing can successfully challenge his authority. Not governors, not kings, not emperors, not soldiers, not Satan, not death, not bureaucrats, not enemies. The same truth applies to his delegates, his ambassadors. We represent the king of kings and we come in his name by his authority, with his message, by his instructions, in his power, according to his promise, with his presence and our efforts cannot fail. And many times his delegates have suffered, even been killed for this message as sheep before slaughter. And yet they are as unconquerable as the purpose and power of the king. What did Jesus promise in Matthew 16, 18? I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. In their training days during Jesus' earthly ministry, the disciples experienced this authority, delegated to them by Jesus, authority over sickness, over demons, over scorpions, over enemies. They saw Jesus' authority over people, over the natural world, over the supernatural world, even over death. And the authority that Jesus has to make everything surrender to his purpose becomes the basis for the impossible task the disciples are about to be given. Feeble followers of Jesus will need courage from this truth to take on an assignment that exceeds their abilities. Notice verse 19 Therefore, go therefore and make disciples. There is a relationship between this command, this commission, and the foundational reality of Jesus' universal authority, which guarantees the success of this mission. That leads to the second feature of the Great Commission we'll look at this morning, the daunting task that demands our obedience. The daunting task that demands our obedience beginning in verse 19, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. To understand the structure of this text, we need to uh, sort of look behind the English a little bit here. In the English, it, it, it appears that go might be the main idea, right? It's a command, go you need to know that in the original language, the main idea, the main verb here is make disciples. It's make disciples. And that idea of making disciples is the, is the command, the instruction, the main verb, and it's 
supported by three participles. Uh, three ideas that sort of modify this command, help bolster this command, explain this command. And those three participles are going, baptizing, and teaching. You could read this verse this way. Make disciples going, baptizing, and teaching. And I want you to understand that for this reason. Sometimes missions has portrayed the idea that the thing that makes the missionary is the going. <clears throat> Excuse me. Scott, I might need that water you offered me earlier <coughs> that I didn't take. We need to dispel with the idea that the going makes the missionary. Just because someone departs, gets on a plane, crosses a border, does not mean that they're obedient to the Great Commission. The idea here is make disciples. Now, you need to understand that these participles carry the imperatival flavor of the main verb. What does that mean? They're all commands. You can't obey the Great Commission and not go. You can't obey the Great Commission and not baptize. You can't obey the Great Commission and not teach. And we'll unfold those things in a moment. The idea is make disciples. There's a reason that go and make disciples shows up first. It's like when your mother told you, go clean your room. Would your mother have been happy with you if you had just left her presence? No. But you weren't going to be able to clean your room unless you went there. Right? Do you understand how go clean your room, the main idea is clean your room, and yet going carries the command force of the main idea. Go clean your room. And so it comes first in the list of modifying participles. The other two, teaching and baptizing, tell us how disciple-making happens. So let's unfold those together. First of all, just notice that this main idea, make disciples, is a command. It's an imperative. It's not a suggestion. It's not an option. The main idea is make disciples. What is a disciple? Fundamentally, a disciple is a learner, a follower, an adherent to a person and to his teaching. The Pharisees had disciples. John the Baptist had disciples. But to be a disciple of Jesus was something different than those disciples. It wasn't just an adherence to an idea or kind of a fan club that followed somebody around. It was a life-changing personal commitment that came with great cost. Jesus said things like Matthew 16, 24. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Right? You can look at Luke 14 to, to give all the, the things that Jesus says, you can't be that, my disciple unless. <laughs> and the unless means prioritizing Jesus over your family, over your possessions, over your life itself. You cannot be my disciple unless you do these things. And the command, go therefore and make disciples. Who can make a disciple? How is this possible? How is this a, a capable command for these 11 or for any who would come after them? Go make disciples of Jesus. <laughs> Go turn people into those who will give up everything to follow him. Do you understand the staggering weight of this command? What must the disciples have been thinking? <laughs> Here are 11 who had scattered from fear meeting the resurrected Christ on a mountain, wondering what's going to happen next. They perhaps had thought that Jesus would be king and establish thrones and set up his kingdom right then and there, and, and they had a, a front row seat, even right and left hand seats to that whole enterprise, and, and now Jesus has been killed, and they've been scattered, and he's going away, and make disciples? Who can make a disciple? And to make disciples of all the nations? For Jews in the first century, this thought was incomprehensible. By the way, we shouldn't think of nations as geopolitical nation states. You cross a border, that's a nation. If the gospel is inside a border that we've put on a map, therefore that nation is covered. That's not what Jesus has in mind here. It's ethnos, ethnicity. The idea is probably something more like a people group 
that share a similar region, similar language, similar values, something like ethnicities. Disciples are to be made from every people group on the earth. This reflects what God has been up to all along. It dates all the way back to Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. God made the promise to Abraham, in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. He didn't say to Abraham, go bless all the families of the earth. He said, I will do this, a promise from God. In Isaiah 25, 6 and 7, here's the promise about eternity future and what it will look like. God of hosts, Yahweh of hosts, will prepare a lavish banquet for all peoples on this mountain. He will swallow up death and he will swallow up the curse which is stretched over all nations. This is what God promised. This is what he has predicted And in Revelation 5, 9, we see that Jesus is the lamb who purchased for God with his blood people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people. And they surround the throne of the lamb in worship. This has been God's plan. But how could these 11 men gathered here be expected to make disciples of all the nations? And there's some clues in this commission that tell us Jesus was intending that these 11 disciples would be disciple-making disciples, who would then make disciple-making disciples, who would in turn make disciple-making disciples. In other words, this commission is not merely directed to the 11 gathered on the mountain in Galilee, but to the subsequent generations of disciples. How do we know this from what Jesus said? Well, he said, make disciples of all nations. The 11 did not finish that task. They did not make it to Tempe, Arizona. They did not make disciples in Papua New Guinea or in Zimbabwe or in Scotland or in Mexico. For the gospel to go to the ends of the earth would require more messengers than the 11 and more time than the first generation of the church. Notice also the universality of Jesus' authority in verse 18. All authority in heaven and on earth, That is, disciples were to be made across the globe. Jesus is not a regional deity, right? Christianity is not the religion of America or of the West. It didn't even start here. It took a long time to get here. It's not the religion of one people group in one place. Jesus is Lord of all, and his message is to go to the ends of the earth. It did not happen in the disciples' time in that first generation. And finally, notice the duration of the promise given in verse 20. Jesus says, I will be with you, plural, all the days, even to the end of the age. You see, the first generation of disciple-making disciples has passed off the scene. The second and the third and the fourth generations of disciple-making disciples have passed off the scene. But all the days have not yet expired, and the end of the age has not yet come. The promise remains, the globe remains, the task is yet unfinished. There are peoples, nations, tribes, and tongues from whom disciples have not yet been made. And so there is a going. Make disciples, going. Go and make disciples. This is not optional. You 11 can't make disciples of all the nations by standing here. This would have been shocking for Jews who had been accustomed to centralized worship of God in Jerusalem. If anyone was to know the God of Israel, they had to come to Israel. But now, something different, go. And disciple-making disciples today must look around to see where disciples have yet to be made and go. We can think of going in terms of the Finisterre Mountains of Papua New Guinea. Zach and Cassidy and their kids go back this week. I saw Brittany Thompson here this morning. Great to see you back, Brittany. Uh, Brittany is one who went, (laughs) grew up in Utah, knows the needs of Mormons to know the gospel of Jesus Christ, and moved to Ephraim, and strategizes every day about how do I share the gospel with these people. And if you don't have her newsletter, you should get her newsletter and pray, and be encouraged to think about your own sphere And think about creative ways. How can I make the gospel known to the people around me? There's a daily energized strategizing about how to get the gospel to the people in our neighborhoods. 
we can all think about the going in terms of stepping up our game in our living room with our little ones. In the classroom, in the break room. Some of us need to think about going beyond our neighborhoods. As a church, we can think about going to the Finisterre Apartments and the Finisterre Mountains. Have you noticed the apartment complex closest to us on Grove Parkway is called Finisterre? That's just ironic. (laughs) We can think about what it means to reach our neighborhoods. Some of us need to think about going farther. That first participle is critical. People don't know the Christ you treasure enough to come and ask you about him very often. There's a going that's critical to making disciples. None of us is still standing on that mountain in Galilee. In one sense, going has significantly taken place. And yet the gospel still must go. The next two participles in this commission give us some detail about how to make disciples. How to make disciples. The first is baptizing. And again, this participle carries the weight of the command of the main verb. Baptizing is not optional. The New Testament knows nothing of an unbaptized Christian. In fact, the first matter of obedience to Jesus Christ after you're born again hear the gospel, repent and believe, is to publicly profess your faith in and affiliation with Jesus and his people through water baptism. Here, baptism in the Great Commission is given as a short summary of being a Christian. Jesus is not instructing his disciples here to simply baptize people, you know, by force, get them in. In fact, if you watch how the disciples applied this through the book of Acts, they preached the gospel, calling people to repent and to believe, and they baptized them after they experienced the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. And you can trace this through the book of Acts. To make disciples by baptizing them means to be preaching the gospel indiscriminately to everyone, everywhere, and then everyone that God saves is to give public testimony to this through baptism. Baptizing the nations. Again, this carries the imperatival weight of the lead verb. In other words, this is part of the command from Jesus. Neglecting baptism for believers is disobedience to the Great Commission. And I want you to notice something in the way that Jesus describes baptism here. Disciples are to be baptized into the name, singular, of the three persons of the Godhead. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's a beautiful, compact way to describe Trinitarian relationships. Even in the public profession of faith and identity of disciples with this Jesus. He is none other than God, none other than the second person of the Trinity. And the three members of the Trinity are in league together in their purpose and plan to redeem people for the Son's glory. The third participle there is teaching, and it picks up in verse 20. Teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. Therefore, going, make disciples, baptizing them and teaching them. Teaching them. Again, this third participle supports the main command to make disciples. And like that second participle, baptizing, this third one, teaching them, tells us more about how to make disciples. And like the others, it is not optional. It carries the imperatival weight of the main verb. In other words, you have to. You have to. To be faithful to the Great Commission means teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. Teaching them. The people from all nations. Teaching them to observe. That is to keep or obey. That is, disciple making is not mere giving of information. Being a disciple is not merely an intellectual assent to facts, but it is life change. In the Great Commission, this command is to teach people to obey Jesus. The Great Commission is not just about gospel presentation. It starts there, but it entails teaching them, notice this, 
all that I commanded you. Not just the gospel truths that get one in, but all of Jesus' commands. The Great Commission is not merely about evangelism, just getting someone across the threshold of salvation, but teaching them to observe everything Jesus directs. And this is not merely the red letter portions of your Bible. Jesus promised the apostles that the Holy Spirit would come and remind them of the things that Jesus had taught them. In addition, the apostles' teaching in the New Testament is the teaching of Christ. The way Jesus instructs his people, the way Jesus has instructed his church is through those apostles, through their teaching on the pages of the New Testament. From the book of Acts all the way to the book of Revelation, these are Jesus' commands. I want you to see this in Acts 2.42. How do the apostles apply this great commission as the church is birthed and as the church grows and as disciple-making disciples make disciple-making disciples? Acts 2.42. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And turn over to Acts 5.42. Every day in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. And as Acts progresses and the church grows and the New Testament grows, the teaching of Christ is reflected in the pages of your Bible. To obey Jesus' commands means to subject your life in obedience to the teaching of the New Testament. The task of making disciples is the task of baptizing, proclamation of the gospel unto public profession of faith, and teaching them to keep Jesus' commands. That is, lives that are in progressive conformity to Jesus' instructions, all of Jesus' instructions including the instruction given here in Matthew 28, the charge to make disciples of all the nations. And how did the 11 go about making disciples of all the nations? That's the record of the book of Acts, the record of church history, and the ministry of faithful churches today and every day until Jesus takes us home. The 11 disciples made disciple-making disciples. And this is what a Christian is, a disciple-making disciple. And I love what Paul says about being one of those who is adequate for these things. Who can do this? Who, who of us is able in our own abilities, in our own strength to do these things? This leads us to the comforting promise, the third feature of the Great Commission. A comforting promise that ensures us of Jesus' presence. Look at the last part of verse 20. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is like Moses crying out to the Lord when he said, if you do not go with us, we don't want to go. In John 6, when Jesus turned to his disciples and asked, are you going to go away too, along with the crowds? And they said, where will we turn? You have the words of life. John 15, Jesus taught his disciples that they are like vines or branches connected to the vine, that apart from Jesus, they could do nothing. That's true. And it is a good thing that Jesus has promised us his very presence every day to the end of the age in this impossible task. Without the promise of Jesus' presence, who could have the heart for this impossible, costly assignment? Who could endure the persecutions, setbacks, challenges, enemies, delays, sorrows involved in this task? If Jesus did not promise his personal presence in this endeavor, the disciples would need more than their own willingness to go, more than their own abilities, more than their own excitement. They would need the power of the Holy Spirit given in Acts 2 and the never leaving, never forsaking presence of Jesus himself. 
This is an impossible task. Sandwiched by the authority that guarantees success and the promise that gives comfort. Jesus is Lord and he is with us. And these are the truths that make possible our impossible commission. This is what drives the church. This is why the church is still on the earth. This is why you, believer, haven't yet been hit by a bus. You're here to be a disciple-making disciple. Whatever else your occupation, whatever your nine to five, whatever your employments, your recreations, your activities, your interests, you are here to be a disciple-making disciple. I want to think about some implications for us as a church and some implications for us as individual believers. I want you to notice what is not here in the Great Commission. Here at the end of the book of Matthew, as Matthew wraps up the, the life and work of Jesus Christ and closes with these departing words, Acts 1.8 uh, says the same things as Jesus is ascending back to the Father. He says, you will be my witnesses in Judea, Jerusalem, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. What's not in these commissioning statements are commands to cure diseases, end poverty, bring an end to injustices, ameliorate suffering, raise standards of living, to acquire the reins of human governments and institutions. There's not a command here for nation building or the promotion of human flourishing, or the arts, or the sciences, or technology, or progress. And and these are good things. And these are things, the things I just described are things that Christians, individual Christians, can do, and in some contexts, should do, under the banner of love your neighbor, But these things are not the Great Commission. They're not the task of the church. You need to understand that all of those things are coming. World peace is coming. The end of disease is coming. The end of poverty is coming. Jesus will put his foot on the earth and reign and rule. He will be king. His kingdom is coming. And into the eternal state, he will once and for all do away with every tear, every sorrow, every pain, every injustice, sin itself, and death itself will go away forever. Those days are coming. And ours are the days of faithful proclamation of the king who was here, who died, who went away to procure a kingdom to bring it back to the earth. We are heralds. We are messengers of the king. We are his representatives and ambassadors. He's coming back. And we must prepare a people for his return. Luke 19, 12 to 27 is a a good picture that describes the, the king who came, went away, and is coming back. And he's coming back with his kingdom. Those who belong to him will love what he loves and will therefore love people. We'll do things like ameliorate suffering and correct injustices on an individual personal level. But it is not the great commission to bring about these things on a global scale. The global task of the church is to make disciple making disciples of all the nations. Here's a second implication. It's related to the first. The church must do what only the church can do. The church must do what only the church can do. We need not ever apologize for carrying out the Great Commission. But if we fail these very clear instructions, we have one to whom we must give an answer. These are our orders. The church's commission is not something the world can accomplish. 
And yet the church has so often been tempted to take her marching orders from the world. The world doesn't know what it most desperately needs, and the world is in no position to dictate to the church what she should be doing. You see, the church's commission transcends the trends and fads of human interest. The church's commission, when followed, accomplishes what the world could never dream of, what the world might hope for but could never get. It raises the dead to life, brings hope to the hopeless, peace to enemies, joy to the downcast, reconciliation with God and reconciliation between men, a reverse of the curse. Listen, church, do not sell out for lesser things. You have a message and a task of incomparable value. Don't trade it for the world's distractions, for temporary fixes, for the world's drugs that numb the senses to man's real need. There's a relationship between this philosophy of ministry statement and the others we've looked at. This statement is make disciples. How do we make disciples? By following the instructions from Jesus in the New Testament, which include preach the word, shepherd the flock, all the others that we have talked about and will talk about in this series. A third implication, the church cannot and must not stagnate. We can't be comfortable here. Here we're equipped here we resonate, get our hearts resonating around the glory of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you have been drawn in to be sent out. There's a reason that at our small group gatherings, we ask four questions of each other. One of those questions has to do with the Great Commission, has to do with evangelism. With whom are you sharing the gospel? Who did God give you opportunity to talk about Christ to this week? Who would you like to be sharing the gospel with? Who are you aiming to take the gospel to? How are you interacting in the place God has put you to make disciple making disciples of Jesus Christ? There's a reason we want to put that question before our hearts every single week. And if you haven't been in small group in a few months and you haven't had your friends asking you that question, we need to fix that. We need to be thinking regularly how am I doing living up to the very reason I'm still on the earth for? Is this in front of me? Is this my heartbeat? Is this what I long for? Is this what I pray for? When I'm talking to other believers, is this what we talk about? Is this how we pray for each other? What is your hobby? What, what are your dreams? What are your ambitions? Is it that my neighborhood might know Christ? That my school where my kids go to school might be a sending place for gospel emissaries? That my workplace would be a bastion of theological conversation centered around the glory of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ? These are the things we need to be thinking about, challenging each other about, keeping in front of our hearts. We can't stagnate. That goes against the very thing the church is programmed to do. A fourth implication, we ought to strategize about how we can make disciples in our neighborhood, in our city, in our nation. There's Thursday night evangelism happening on Mill Avenue. Uh, you can talk to Omri Miles about that. There's evangelism going on in the neighborhoods surrounding our campus. Uh, talk to Jeff Maxwell and others who have intentional efforts to share the gospel with people around us. Can we strategize about a way to reach our Spanish-speaking neighbors right here in Guadalupe? A stone's throw away? An ESL program? Anybody speak Spanish? <laughs> Think about planting biblical churches in this valley. Think about training men to shepherd in churches beyond our city, beyond our state. A fifth implication, we ought to strategize about how we can make disciples of all nations. Not just our neighborhoods, not just our city, not just this valley. In what ways will GBC be a part of what Christ is doing to build his church to the ends of the earth? You, you know, friends, that three normal, regular families from this church felt that need and moved to Papua New Guinea. You've been a part of that. You've been entwined in their lives 
you've suffered with them in that, you've rejoiced with them in that, and that work continues. We ought to have a longing for people from every tongue and tribe and nation people to know our Savior. A sixth implication, we must equip every believer to make disciples in the places they have already gone. None of us is standing on that mountain in Galilee. We're here. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, Tempe, it's really far away. There's a sense of going that has already taken place. Are we maximizing the went? The gone? We we got here, now what? Again, it's not the going that makes the missionary, it's the baptizing and teaching that is the how that we must follow. A seventh implication, we must specially equip choice disciples to go to places and peoples the gospel has not yet reached. Cans, Dodds, Laymans. An eighth implication, some of you need to go away, far away. Consider being specially trained to take the gospel to the people who have never heard. And we can't send the dregs, we must send the best. Consider being trained to that end. Scott mentioned our book of the month. Um, I asked Jeff this morning to extend it to May as well. So for the next month, he's got 12 copies left of Andy Johnson's book, Missions, How the Local Church Goes Global. I've spent my life reading books about missions. This is my favorite, and it's small. You can read it. I would be encouraged if every one of us read it, kept it on our shelves, read it to our kids, and just refreshed our hearts about the things we know and love already. It is the best representation of the way Grace Bible Church thinks about missions. And I didn't have to write it. It's great. It's already in print. We must do what Jesus commissioned us to do. In order to do this, we must know that Jesus is Lord and Jesus is with us. When John G. Patton went to Vanuatu and his predecessor had been killed and eaten by the people who lived there, if he was going to have boldness and courage to take the gospel to people he knew would surround the throne of the Lamb one day, that he would need to know that Jesus is Lord and Jesus is with him. When John Eliot came to the American colonies in the 1620s, Faithfully part of a local church like this one. But notice that nations of people surrounding were gospel-less, Bible-less. He looked at the nearby Algonquin Indians and at 40 years old decided, you know what, I need to learn Algonquin. (laughs) And he learned a complicated language, its syntax and its grammar and its vocabulary, and he spent his life translating the entire Bible into Algonquin and seeing multiple churches birthed that then became church-making churches, disciple-making disciplers of believers in Jesus Christ. If he was to take on that task, he would need to know that Jesus is Lord and Jesus was with him. A mom spending her days with little ones at home needs to know that Jesus is Lord and Jesus is with her. Zach and Cassidy, you'll need to know that. Wayman and Lee and the pastors, pastors that are trained all over the world to do this very thing, they need to know that Jesus is Lord and Jesus is with them. Massimo and Susanna, pray for them. They need to know that Jesus is Lord over Italy and he is with them. The Mitchells need to know, Amelia needs to know that Jesus is Lord over bureaucracies and visas, and he is with them. It was said that the Moravian missionaries who were willing to become slaves themselves in order to preach the gospel to slaves in the Caribbean, as they said goodbye to loved ones, may the lamb receive the reward of his suffering. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, that is indeed our motivation that you would receive the reward of your suffering, that the ones whom you purchased with your blood would come to know you. And you've laid out the way that they will come to know you, and it is by the beautiful feet of faithful ones who go and proclaim and baptize and teach. God, we pray for the success 
of this endeavor, knowing that it is guaranteed by the authority that you have over everything. And we go with the comfort of knowing that you go with us to the end of the age.